Difficulty. Good morning. It's great to see you all today. My name is Jen and welcome to a class on adaptation. So I thought that we could start at our lovely jelly webcam that we have here. Ah, they are so incredibly gorgeous getting a chance to look at these West Coast sea nettles that we have. Now, today, since we're focusing on adaptations, uh, if you have any questions, comments, we would love to hear from you. Go on ahead and send in a text if you'd like to, of course, that number that we all know, 562-286-1838, right down here below. And of course, if you're watching this at a later time, that's not Friday at 9 a.m., you can go on ahead. I'm not very good with my dates. You can go on ahead and uh, email us at live at lbaop dot org down below and then we'll get a chance to answer those questions too so we're going to go on ahead and we're going to start with these jellies right here what do you notice because today we're focusing on features of an animal that help them to survive so we're looking at those adaptations today If you want to send in those observations, we'd love to hear from you too. I know something that I am noticing are their colors, right? Colors too can be an adaptation. So what kind of colors do you see? I know for me, I'm seeing lots of kind of orangey, yellowy colors in their bell. So that's the actual body of our jelly right here that we can see, right? So all of those round circles, right, are all of those bells, those body parts that we're seeing right there. Hmm. I also am noticing that there's a lot of white frills. Are you seeing that too? A lot of white frilly parts and almost like strings that are coming down. And as they move, right, I can notice that the bell or the body of the jelly, right, the circle part is actually what we like to call pulsing, right? It's moving a lot, but all of those stringy parts are just kind of floating along, right? And so that kind of gives me an idea that a lot of the muscles are going to be in that bell area and this part, not so much. Now, as a matter of fact, these are where their arms and the tentacles are of our jelly. Now, these arms and the tentacles definitely help these animals to eat. But how? If we think about some special features of our jelly that help it to survive, what's one thing that really kind of comes to mind? If you're thinking singing, Yes, right? So these jellies have stinging cells that are on all of those little, basically stringy parts that you see. Not the, whist not the, uh, the frilly parts, but just the stringy parts. And those are going to be all of the tentacles of our jelly. So those tentacles have all those stinging cells that sting the animal to then help it to, well, bring it into the mouth of the jelly, which is actually located in the very middle of that bell. But how does it get the food from those tentacles all the way into its mouth? Well, those oral arms, those stringy parts right here that we see, those fluffy ones, right? Those arms help bring that food out directly into the mouth of the jelly. So it's a really cool adaptation that these animals have to be able to sting their food and help bring it on in. But as we look at these jellies right here, well, what do you think they might be seeing? What do you think they might be eating? Ooh, Junie is actually asking how big, right? Because on this camera, they look absolutely huge. Now, for these, these are called West Coast sea nettles, and they are definitely not the biggest jelly. They are, I would probably say maybe about like, their bell is maybe like a foot or smaller, about half half a foot, they're about six inches to maybe eight, 10 inches um, is the round part. And then all of the trailing tentacles are probably about, about 12 feet long total, as long as. Um, so that's about the size for our sea nettles here. But if you wanna think about like a bigger jelly, like the lion's mane jelly, they can actually get six feet wide and have 50 foot long oral arms 
and tentacles. They can expand forever and ever, and it could just keep on going and going and going. It's actually the largest jelly. So we don't have those here because they're a little bit too big for us, but you get these lovely sea nettles instead, right? But you know what? Large or small, many of these jellies have those same adaptations, right? Where they're able to sting and to be able to get their food. And so if we think about maybe what kind of food these animals might eat, right? A lot of times it might be smaller animals, like maybe some smaller fish. Maybe sometimes it's other jellies. Maybe it could be plankton, small little microscopic animals that they also might catch to be able to sting and eat. It all depends on the kind of jelly, but they all share those similar features, those similar adaptations. So here we go. Here we can see, thank you, Amanda, some of those wonderful plankton that these jellies can eat, depending upon the variety. Pretty cool to see this underwater microscopic world. Now, of course, I'm actually not alone in the studio. I have Amanda who's showcasing all of these wonderful images. And then we also have Erin who's taking in all your questions and observations. So thank you everyone for sending them in. Once again, we'd love to be able to hear from you. Um, so feel free to bring in any of those comments, questions, 562-286-1838. Now, since the class is on adaptations, I thought we could go on ahead and explore some of the different animals that we don't always get a chance to talk about. But I wanted to start out with a classic, right? Jellies, they're really cool, really beautiful animals. Now let's move on to something that's a little bit more bizarre, but definitely a fan favorite here, definitely within our education department. And that little animal is called a spiny lump sucker. It is a little fish. It is a tiny fish. It is about this big in size, though it may look mighty on the screen as Amanda tries to find that image for us. But these animals, if you think about the name, Spiny lump sucker. My goodness, that is quite a name, right? What kind of image comes to mind? I mean, it's got to have some cool adaptations, right? It's just in its name. Probably is spiny. Probably is a little lumpy. Sucker. Well, probably has a suction cup, right? So with this animal that we have, it is exactly that. There are lots of different varieties of spiny lump suckers, but here you can see one. And like I said, they're really tiny, but they're really amazing animals. And there it is. It is using that sucker part right here to be able to stick to that rock, which is pretty incredible stuff, right? What other adaptations do you notice on this cute little fish? Now, as I mentioned, there are varieties of them, so maybe seeing a different picture might inspire you to think about what some of those adaptations might be. Hmm. Now, if we look even at the color of the animal, what colors did you notice? Hmm. Well, I definitely noticed some kind of almost like rusty, rusty brown colors that actually blended in really nicely with that rock surface. So that's really cool, getting a chance to be able to see um, how colors, once again, can help. Ah, now here we have ones that are a little bit more tan in color, right? But what other adaptations do you notice? Do you see those large eyes? I definitely think it's one of the best features of these animals these large eyes, and maybe we can get a chance to see a little bit more on how they move. So their eyes, they're really big, right? Um, as we go on ahead, and I'm having Amanda try to find another video for us that really kind of showcases the movement of their eyes, but if they have big eyes, do you think they find them really useful? Yeah, right? So these large eyes really help them to see. Oh my goodness, I love that expression and that face. So cute. All right, so there we go. And we'll get a chance, I think in a little bit, yeah, you'll get a chance to see some of the movement of their eyes. Oh, maybe not this video. <laughs> That's okay, but as we go on ahead and we look, right, we can see that suction cup that they have that helps them to stick. And we also see all of these little spiny bumps, right? So in its name, spiny lump sucker, 
How do you think these spines, what do you think might be the purpose of these spines? Thinking protection, yeah, right? So this animal is very small and it uses a variety of different adaptations that are a little bit unique to really help it to survive, whether it be matching with the seaweed right here, really kind of, um, you know, suctioning itself down so that way if there's currents that are moving back and forth, um, you know, it's able to kind of stick on. These animals do happen to live more in the Pacific Northwest region, so where it's really cold and where there's strong currents that are going by. And so they have to really keep vigilant and keep their eyes open, and their eyes can actually move all, oops, all around, and those eyes really help them to be able to see what kind of potential dangers or foods might be nearby. Now they also had that little mouth, right? So any thoughts to what kind of foods our spiny lump suckers might eat? Mm, there we go, we can see its mouth really nicely here. And those spikes, it's actually pretty cool. I'll step out of the screen for a second. Well, something that I notice about this mouth is that it's kind of forward facing, right? And we can actually tell a lot about an animal by looking at not only where the mouth is placed, but also which way it's turned. Is it turned upwards? Is it turned downwards? Is it turned directly in front, right? All of those different mouth turny types and where it's placed helps us figure out maybe what kind of food it might eat and how it might eat it. So here we can see that it's a little bit downturned, not very much, just slightly, and that it's basically in the middle of its face. So it probably eats directly in front of it, right? And it's a really small animal to begin with. It has a really small mouth. So if you're thinking small foods, yes, right? So this animal is great at eating. We talked a little bit about plankton earlier, kind of the step in between. So we're thinking of things like krill and you know maybe smaller kind of shrimp-like animals. Uh, a lot of invertebrate animals, right? Things that may live on these rocks, little, little almost like um, uh, shrimpy-like things that may hop across. And so these spiny lump suckers are great at being able to eat all of those little teeny tiny shrimp-like animals. And so it's really cool that these animals are able to eat that level of our food chain, right? Uh, these are definitely one of my favorites. All right, so we can also go on ahead and look at another animal. We've had a chance to really kind of focus in on jellies, animals with no bones in their bodies, spiny lump suckers, which are bony fish, and these bony fish help them, right? Or these bony fish allow them to be able to have some really cool adaptations. We only touched on one kind of bony fish. But we also have some animals that we really don't talk very much about but we have here at the aquarium, which are lorikeets. So they're a completely different kind of animal, right? They're a bird. And these birds have really unique adaptations too. Um, with these birds, they are, well, you tell me. What exactly do you notice about this bird? Where do you think it might live? Hmm. All right, so if we go on ahead and we look at our bird friend here, right, uh, what'd you notice? Something that I noticed that was really colorful, right? Do we only have a chance to see the top part of the body? I know Amanda's looking for a more full body picture, but as we go on ahead and we think about this bird, why do you think it's so colorful? Hmm. Where do you think it might live if it has all those colors? Now, sometimes for me, when I see things that are lots of colors and it's in a different habitat that I may not be familiar with, I think about where I'm seeing these patterns and these colors. Like for me, when I think of bright colors, I think of coral reefs. I think about how bright fish can live in a really bright habitat and that and they match. Now, if I think about a bright habitat on land, what do you think of? I 
definitely think of like a tropical forest, right? So the lorikeets are actually part of a tropical forest, kind of like what you would see here. That would be an above ground version kind of of our coral reefs. So with our lorikeets, right, they are really great at getting a chance to blend in with the tropical forest. I know it's hard to imagine, right? They have so many different patches of colors, but it's really amazing that they can. Their green, right, blends in really nicely with the background of the plants that live there. And all of those other bright colors that, you're, that you had a chance to see really kind of focus in and look a lot like the bright flowers, much like the hibiscus that you had a chance to see our lorikeets next to, right? Same thing for our, our birds, is that they are able to really blend in with many of the different, uh, with the different flowers that they are found next to. So that's really cool. Now, something else that's really interesting though is how they eat. If we go ahead and we look at this tropical bird right here, they have a really weird tongue. Do you notice this too? It almost looks fuzzy, doesn't it? Any thoughts to what they might eat with a fuzzy tongue like that? Definitely doesn't seem like seeds to me, right? <laughs> It's really weird, but believe it or not, these animals are considered nectivores, meaning that they eat nectar or drink nectar, right? So they use that tongue right there to really be able to slurp up nectar really easily. And that helps them to drink any kind of um, nectar from flowers or really kind of munch up any kind of fruits to really squeeze out the juices from them. So they are very incredible animals that are able to, to really kind of use the forest in ways that one wouldn't normally always think about. All right, now, do any of you have a favorite animal that you really enjoy their adaptations? We'd love to be able to hear from you. Go on ahead, send us a text if you'd like, send us in any questions that you might have. There are lots of fun adaptations that are really cool for many of these different animals. Now, if we even think about one off of our California coast, like our Garibaldi, right? So it's actually, if you think about kind of tropical colors, right, being inspired by our lorikeets, our Garibaldi is actually that same way. It's brightly colored. But here's the weird part. It is very much in a very drab environment. So with that, this animal is really brightly colored, which is kind of odd, right? It's very different than our lorikeets that we talked about earlier, or as Amanda showcased many of the corals, right? Also very different. Does not live in a coral reef habitat. It lives with a lot of greens and browns and grays and blacks. But this coloration is actually a really cool and special adaptation that is very useful to this animal as it's a way to say, hey, back off, I'm a fierce fish and this territory is all mine. And so it uses the color in a very different way. Now here within California, right? Uh, this is just one really cool animal with an adaptation that really hits home. But we are fortunate enough today to be able to have one of our aviculturists. We're able to have one of our husbandry staff members, a person that takes care of our animals here at the aquarium. And we are so lucky to have another California bird and its name is Orion and it is an American kestrel. So I am super excited to be able to bring in Gary to be able to talk about this amazing bird. And once again, we'd love to hear from you. So go on ahead, send us in any kind of questions that you might have and, uh, and it should be really exciting. So I'm gonna go on ahead and have Gary come on in and take it away. Just kidding. <laughs> we want to build up the suspense for you all, of course. Otherwise, it would just be too easy. Of course, these animals, right? They are live animals. So we're just waiting to be able to bring Orion on in. And you can think about what kind of observations do you notice? What kind of adaptations do you see? And Gary's going to share that with us. Well, thank you. Good morning. Did you say we're on animal time this morning, right? <laughs> yes, this is a little Orion. Uh, Orion is a California crest, uh, I mean, a, an American kestrel. And she looks like a baby, but actually, this is full grown. So it's a member of the falcon family. 
which means it's a bird of prey. And uh, normally falcons are a lot bigger. That's when we think of like the peregrine falcon. But some species are pretty small, like, um, like Orion here, who's our little kestrel. So one of the cool things about kestrels is the fact that they're very, very fast moving. They, if you think about most birds of prey, like a hawk or an eagle, what their hunting style is, is they like to get really, really high up in the sky. They'll be right around where the clouds are. And their vision is so amazing that they can be flying up there with the clouds and they can see a little mouse running around on the ground. And so what a hawk does is as it's looking around, checking out the field, checking out the grass, sees that mouse, it tucks in its wings and it can go into dive like 100 miles an hour. And it goes right to the ground, flares out its wings at the very last minute and its little tail feathers, and it grabs with its little powerful feet. And it'll grab that little mouse on the back and the mouse never knows what happens. With the falcon, it's a little bit different. Their hunting style is again, they get really high up in the sky, but they're looking for other flying objects. So instead of being like that stealth bomber that's over the cloud layer, looking down at the ground, these guys are looking all over the place and they're trying to see any flying object that might be nearby that could be a potential meal. So their shape of their faces are different than a hawk because they have to look around them. So take a close look. Well, Ryan, help us out and look towards the camera, please. It's right over, thank you, it's right over there. Go ahead and look at her head. You'll see it's more rounded and almost shaped like a helmet. If you look at a hawk's face, it's going to be flat with very prominent ridges above the eyes. They have that to cut the glare of the sun that's above their faces. But with the falcon who's looking at me more than the camera, okay. When the falcon is looking for its prey, it's looking all around its environment. So it has a round head and a good feel of vision. But we're also looking into the sun and that can create a lot of glare that might impede on their ability to find food. So look at the falcon's face. You know what I'm going to do is I'm going to help it out here by offering her a little worm. Um, I'm reaching for it. Here you go. She likes these. That's like her special little treat. There you go. You see underneath the eyes right there. Perfect shot right there. Underneath the eyes, you could see some very clear dark markings, kind of like a football player. And those dark markings cut the glare of the sun, just like it does when a football player is out on the field playing their game. So I don't know who it came first, the falcon or the football player. I'm guessing it probably was ke the kestrel. Now, you do find these locally, uh, but you'll have a hard time seeing them. They're usually up there, obviously, in the mountain forests. But they're so fast and they're so maneuverable that they could buzz by you and you don't even realize that it went by. And especially, you wouldn't think it was a bird of prey. you think it might be like a sparrow. But what they're basically looking for is like a, a grasshopper, or uh, maybe a really small, small bird is what they'd be preying on. Now, they don't have a chance to be babies for very long. Once they're hatched, in a couple of weeks, they're full grown. By a month, they're ready to leave the nest. And they have to fend for themselves, which means they've got to find food very quickly. They don't have a lot of body weight on them because they're trying to fly. So unlike us, where we could carry on a little extra pound to get us through the winter, they need to hunt every day basically, or every other day, if they're unsuccessful in finding food, they start to get weak and they get a little desperate. So what happens with a lot of the babies, they get a little over anxious when they're trying to hunt and find food and they end up hurting themselves. And that's what happened to our little kestrel right here. She was probably learning how to hunt in her first couple of months, dove into the bushes way too enthusiastically and damaged her wing. But you know what? Here at the Aquarium of the Pacific, we take really good care of her. She's got a beautiful little home here. She can fly down, which is great. So she can still move around, but she obviously wouldn't be able to chase that grasshopper down right now, but she lives a beautiful life right here. And so if you ever wondered how you can protect the wildlife that you find in your lake, local areas, um, just be, keep in mind that um, preserving their natural habitats, whenever you hear about that, uh, that the importance of protecting those little forests, it's because of little birds like this that are trying to make a living out there. And we know that when you come to the aquarium and you support us, you're supporting our efforts and making sure we're helping the environment. So thank you very much. Good morning.
much, Gary. Wasn't that cool getting a chance to learn a little bit about one of the, the native birds here within California, that kestrel. What I love about it is that you're really able to, to see a bird that you have a harder time seeing out in the wild. So that's some really cool adaptations. So if we go on ahead and we kind of recap today about, well, some of the adaptations, right? All of these animals have really incredible features to help them to survive, whether it be our, um, our spiny lump sucker that has all those different spikes on it, that large suction cup, those big rotating eyes that help it to survive, and that forward-facing mouth, right? Those are some cool adaptations of that fish. If we think a little bit about our jellies, right? They've been around for hundreds and hundreds of years, and they have no heart, no brains, but yet they're able to still capture their food by stinging it, using those long oral arms to bring it then into the mouth of the, of the jelly itself, which is really incredible for such a simple animal that has no bones either. And then, of course, we also had a chance to learn a little bit about... Um, about, oh my goodness, about our lorikeets, right? Seeing that tongue, seeing the different colors, but then also quickly touching upon our Garibaldi, using colors in a completely different way. So animals are always keeping us on our toes in regards to different kinds of adaptations that they have. Ah, now I did get um, an interesting question that came in, and that question was, um, you know, do you have a favorite animal with adaptation? So thank you so very much for asking. You know, for me, I would probably have to say, aside from the spiny lump sucker, um, mud skippers are actually one of my favorites. Now, these are weird animals that have eyes that are on the top of their heads that actually live in mud. They are a type of fish, but they're considered an amphibious fish. I'll step out of the way real quick. And with this animal, you can see, right? Really interesting adaptations there where those eyes are directly on top of their head and they, when they blink, they actually moisten their eyes and their eyes pretty much go directly inside. Now, of course, their mouths are a little bit underneath. So they like to eat a lot of critters that are found um, in and around mud. And they also use it to scoop mud out. So that way they can make their own mud burrows, which is really interesting. Now we do have them here at the aquarium and they do build burrows and they live in these mud flats where we have tides that come in and out. And so they have to constantly be maintaining their burrows in order for them to, to live their, their happy little lives. Now, because they live on mud flats, they also, as, as I mentioned, they're considered amphibious fish, they also breathe air. Yep, a little bit differently than you or I would, right? But they are able to kind of hold their breath. Um, and they also have gills. So that really helps them to kind of be that amphibious fish. Look at that face. How can you not love that face? <laughs> Then they also have these fins that you can see right down here that they kind of use to be able to prop and help them to be able to walk around. So these fish can just kind of walk like that, which is really incredible. All right, friends, thank you so very much for your questions today. We'd love to be able to get any teachers that we're watching to bring in those numbers. So if you wouldn't mind texting us um, on our text line, 562 286 1838. Uh, we'd love to be able to have you send in how many students are watching today. And this helps us really to be able to uh, prioritize content to you and just see the audience and the reach that we are able to, to give. So thank you so very much, everyone, for joining us today. And we'll see you for our 10 o'clock class, which is focusing on our planet Earth as a whole. So it'll be very exciting. Feel free to join us for our 10 a.m. class. Have a great day, everyone.